Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings that we could experience throughout the week, and we thank you so much for this morning, for your grace, for being able to come here and study together. May your Spirit guide us in Jesus' name, amen. As you probably remember from this time, here on this side, there was a strong focus on fertility, the fertility of Jacob's wives. You had Leah first giving birth, then Bilhah, then Zilpah, and then finally, as you come closer and closer here, at one point it says that God remembered Rachel and she conceived. On this side of the story here, there is a strong focus on fertility, but this time it's not the wives, but it is the flocks of Jacob versus the flocks of Laban. So we want to see the common denominator of these two segments and I would like to start reading chapter 29, starting with verse 31. It says, When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, the Lord, Yahweh, that's the word there, the Lord. So please keep in mind that who does the work here, yes, Leah conceives, and obviously she conceives naturally by Jacob, but it is the Lord, Leah says, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord. Okay, so again, because Yahweh has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Therefore his name was called Levi. Here it's not mentioned that the Lord. But then as you go on, and she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Lord, again, Yahweh. Therefore she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Now when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, Give me children or else I die. And that's a pretty strong request. Give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was aroused against Rachel. And he said, am I in the place of God? Okay, again, this God motive comes back. Am I in the place of God who withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So she said, here is my maid Bilhah, go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Then she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as wife. And Jacob went into her. And it goes on, and Bilhah conceived and uh, bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God, again, God, God has judged my case. And he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Therefore, she called his name Dan. 
And the story goes on, but what I wanted to emphasize is that there's a strong focus among all the challenges on God here. I have some verses listed on the worksheet. Verse 27 in chapter 30. This is what it says. And Laban said to him, Please stay if I have found favor in your eyes, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. Then he said, name me your wages and I will give it. This is again a very important moment when Laban, seeing that Jacob wants to go home, says, hey, stay with me. I will pay you and I will pay you well. But what I want you to see is the focus on God again. Yahweh. So Yahweh here and Yahweh over here. Laban says, I have learned by experience that the Lord, Yahweh, and he names God Yahweh, Yahweh did what he did. And that's why I uh, was blessed through you. Then if you go to verses 32 and uh, onward, this is what it says. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from there all the speckled and spotted sheep and all the brown ones among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and these shall be my wages. This is where Jacob speaks to Laban and asks for his share. But the way the story is shaped, there's a focus on verse 33, and this is what it says. So my righteousness will answer for me in time to come when the subject of my wages comes before you, everyone that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the lambs will be considered stolen if it is with me. So what Jacob says is, hey, I want to build a case for the future because he anticipates the fact that no matter how he will turn with his desire, with his request, at one point his case will come to Laban and Laban will try to twist it again. So he puts some very specific elements in place. He speaks about the brown, the spotted, the speckled. And he says, I'm doing this, I'm asking for this, because I want to make sure in the future, my righteousness will answer for me when it comes before you. Because there will be a time when somebody, maybe your sons, will come to you and say, hey, this Jacob did this and that and that. And uh, there is something practical about this, because I told you exactly what I'm asking for, and that's exactly what I will be doing. And if you want to see if I'm honest or dishonest with what I'm doing, you can go to my flocks and see what I have there. It's very simple. It's practical. You cannot turn it or twist it. So let's go by this. And Laban accepts. But then, of course, the moment after, he starts playing Jacob around again. Because Jacob said, this is what my share would be. And the first action Laban takes is he goes and gets out of the flock exactly those elements Jacob is asking for. Jacob probably has in mind some sort of uh, 
breeding process by which he can multiply his flocks and Laban gets it, so he says, no, no, we are not doing that the way you think it will work. And now in the story, again, God appears. Look at verse 3 in chapter 31, verse 3. Then the Lord, that's Yahweh, said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your family, and I will be with you. So, in the context of um, Jacob being tricked again by Laban, God shows up to him and speaks to him personally. You probably read that description starting with 37 in chapter 30. The description of uh, the genetic engineering that Jacob tried to implement. There were some rods, green poplar rods, and almond and chestnut. He peeled white stripes in them, that's verse 37, and exposed the white which was in the rods. There's a very detailed, careful description of what he did. And God was working with him. I cannot tell you if there's any science in that description. There are some that say, yeah, that is scientific. It's based on epigenetics. Epigenetics is a relatively new branch of genetics, which says that although the genetic sequence of beings cannot be changed, so you cannot operate a change in the genetic sequence, the manifestations can be altered. That is, you can influence by some exterior factors what genes will be and what genes will not be activated. So that's the theory of epigenetics. Again, if there is science in it, then God used science. But what I know from the story, because Jacob will tell us later on, is that God revealed some things to him in a dream. So the focus is not on his own skillful engineering abilities, but on God, the one that reveals what can happen. Verse 7 says in 31, Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times, but God did not allow him to hurt me. This is the moment when Jacob speaks with his wives. If you read the story, you know that at one point, Laban himself became hostile to him. And that's when Jacob calls his wives, probably just Leah and Rachel, out in the field, and they have a family conversation there. And that's when Jacob says, yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. Can you imagine what this is? Imagine yourself being hired, being at work, or working for the same company for 14 years first, and then for another six years, because total he had 20 years. But you can feel constantly how somebody tries to trick you, to fool you. And he says, yeah, that's what your father did to me, but God did not allow him to hurt me. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and 
given them to me, verse 9. So again, it is God that does this. God took away the livestock of your father. Then verse 11 says, Then the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here I am. The angel of the Lord, or the angel of God, again, is God's messenger, whether that is an angel in the sense of uh, a heavenly being, or it's Jesus himself, because there are descriptions in which it is clear that the angel of the Lord is Jesus. The point here is that God, 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 God is in action. Verse 13, in his report to his wives, again, Jacob says that God showed up to him and said, I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me, now arise, get out of this land and return to the land of your family. Verse 16, for all these riches which God has taken from our father are really ours, because these are the wives speaking, are really ours and our children's. Now then, whatever God has said to you, do it. It seems that the wives also see the hand of God in whatever happened with their family. And that's important to notice because here the focus on God in the section of the wife's fertility comes exactly from their mouths. It is the wives, Jacob's wives, that almost compete against one another who is more blessed by God. And here they recognize that it was God's hand in their lives. Going on, verse 24 says, But God had come to Laban the Syrian in a dream by night and said to him, Be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So this is after the moment when they leave and Laban is disturbed because practically they stole away. They left without Laban knowing. And even if Jacob now is a father of a huge family, Laban still treats them as his property. And that's when the text says that God came to Laban the Syrian and spoke to him. Now, if somebody thought God only can speak to Jacob, no, God can speak to Laban as well. Even if we have a pretty bad picture of Laban. Then verse 29, it is in my power to do you harm, says Laban when he catches up with the fugitives. But the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, be careful that you speak to Jacob neither good nor bad. So again, the God of your father spoke to me last night. So first we have the story teller tell us what happened, and then Laban himself gives us a report when he speaks to Jacob. Tells him, hey, God, the God of your father spoke to me. Verse 42, now Jacob speaks to Laban. Unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, Surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. So again, it's God. God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. 
So Jacob has a, an acute awareness of God being at work in this. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us, and this is the moment when they have that covenantal promise to one another that they will not pass the pile of stones, one going to the other, with the intention of doing harm. So, the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of their father judge between us, and Jacob swore by the fear of his father Isaac. It's interesting that here, this God, Yahweh, is called the God of Abraham and also the God of Nahor. Why, you would think? Is there an explanation for that? Sure. Because Jacob is a descendant of Abraham, and Laban is a descendant of Nahor, or Nahor. But these two, what, what is the relationship between this and this, Abraham and Nahor? Brothers. They are brothers. When Abraham wanted Eliezer to bring a wife for Isaac, okay, that was the reason he knew his family there was a believer of Yahweh. Then later on, when Isaac sends Jacob, the same reasoning, you know, there was a conversation between uh, uh, Isaac and Rebekah, Isaac and his wife, about uh, the wives of Esau. Esau took wives from uh, the Hittites, from the Canaanites, and that was uh, a source of bitterness for them. And that's when Rebekah, exploiting this whole thing, convinces Isaac to send Jacob away with his blessings to find a wife in Haran. Because, yeah, Yahweh was known by both Abraham and Nahor. And if you go back to chapters 11 and 12, you will get the picture that this is what happened. First, the entire family of Abraham came from Ur, from Mesopotamia, somewhat like this, to Haran, and then a large part of the family stopped here. And only Abraham and Lot went down to Canaan. Okay? But on this segment of the journey, we still have Terah, Haran, which is the eldest brother of Abraham and Nahor, and Nahor and Abraham. So here the family is still complete. By the time we get here and uh, Abraham moves on, it seems that Haran passed away. That's how Laban, being an orphan, becomes a um, child, soul child, to Abraham, and uh, Lot goes with Abraham all the way down to Canaan. But the knowledge of Yahweh, probably at a different level than Abraham had it, was already in his family. So they worshipped Yahweh. Any question? The question is, how did they worship Yahweh if Laban had house idols? Huh? Because in the same text, we get to know that Laban's house idols were stolen by whom? By Rachel. And that's what really made Laban mad. Right? When Laban comes... 
and uh, catches up with them, he does what you would call today a house search. And, and Rachel gets on the back of the camel and she hides the things in the saddle. So that was a pretty big thing. Yahweh, there, there's no way to have idols for Yahweh. Yahweh specifically speaks later against any kind of representation of himself. Yahweh does not want to be represented in any way. Because there's no way to represent Yahweh. There's no way to create an idol that represents Yahweh. Unless you have a limited knowledge of Yahweh. Or you are still at a stage where you do have Yahweh and you have a high regard of Yahweh. But at the same time you have some other deities as well. So in other words, Yahweh is one among the many gods. So it is another way of doing polytheistic worship, having Yahweh as part of the pantheon. Later in the time of the Apostle Paul, he goes to Athens. You can read that in Acts chapter 17. And very cleverly, as he walks around in the city, he sees an altar dedicated to an unknown god. So among the gods of the Greeks, there was an unknown god, and they even made an altar to him. From the outside, nothing indicates that that unknown god was indeed Yahweh. And yet, probably for missionary purposes, this is what Paul's approach is. He says, hey guys, in your city, you guys have this altar. This altar dedicated to an unknown God. Well guys, I'm here to speak to you about that unknown God. And he starts speaking to them about the God of the Bible. I think that is remarkable. And I just made the connection so we can see that, one, God works with people in their context, even if they do not have a full-blown picture of who he is. And second... God wants us to be clever and look out carefully and see if there is anything in a specific culture that hints on him somehow and then we can enhance the view of that hint in that culture like Paul did in Athens when he said, hey, you have an altar for the unknown God. I'm here to speak to you more about him. I, I need you to understand one thing. When I do these Bible studies, I'm learning myself. I've read the Bible. I've read through the Bible. I've never done a structural and literary study of the Bible the way I'm doing it now. And I'm amazed to see the richness of the text. And the reason I point out these connections is because I want to stir thinking. I could come and uh, do some Bible lessons, some doctrinal lessons, and say this and this and this and this and this. Good. That's not my intention. You can get that in any Bible study class. And you can even find series of Bible studies that do that. And those are good for their purpose. Here we are going one layer deeper. We are going to where we want to understand the text, wrestle with it, fight with it, and uh, 
get a deep knowledge of how God interacts with people in different times, in different contexts? Good question. So he, here, we have a pretty soft attitude from God toward Abraham's family. To Laban, God appears and speaks to him directly, and it's not very condemning or rejecting. God is pretty categorical with him, nevertheless, because God tells him, watch out, because uh, if you go and uh, hit Jacob, it's going to be bad for you. So God works with him. So the question is this. If we have this soft attitude toward Laban from Nahor's family, how come later on when we have Israel and uh, the Canaanites, God seems to be so categorical against polytheistic worship. And if Israel takes some features of that worship, then uh, it almost looks like God uh, cracks down on the Israelites because of uh, uh, borrowing some cultic elements of the pagans. Do you see what the dilemma is? Why is God so trenchant, so categorical with Israel and not so much with Nahor and his family? Well, I believe there is an answer to that. When God speaks to Israel and Israel comes out from Egypt and Israel lives in Canaan, before settling down in Canaan, God says that the measure of the iniquity of the Canaanites is full. So that's a very important element in the answer. The measure of the iniquity of the Canaanites reached the peak. So that's why God deals with the Canaanites the way he deals with them. It's not racial, it's not ethnic bias, it's not any kind of other craziness. No, it is God dealing with them in a certain way because of their iniquity. Now, to Israel, God tells you should not take, you should not borrow elements of their cultic, of their worship uh, rituals and use it in your rituals. You cannot have Yahweh and some other gods. But at this point, God is working with Israel, and Israel is the descendant of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because Jacob is the one that got the name Israel. So here we have God teaching them. And even here, with the exception of uh, some very specific laws that can even scare you, God still works with them. And we see them later on when Israel becomes uh, idolatrous. God did not crack down on them right away. God worked with them. Let me just uh, uh, give you a little picture of the time when God allowed Assyria and then Babylon to take Israel into captivity. First, God used his prophets to tell them, guys, repent and you will stay here. You will not go into captivity. Then God tells them through his prophets, guys, repent but even if you repent at this point, they will still come. 
and the exile now will not be avoided. And then there's a, a third phase in which God uh, tells them, guys, you're in exile, but I'm here with you. I'm still working with you, and I will still get you back. So God's grace is manifested throughout. But I think the big um, element that can clarify is the level of knowledge. So practically we have two important components. One is iniquity, and the other element is knowledge. How much do you know about God? God does not hold somebody accountable for things somebody does not know. God holds you accountable based on the level of knowledge and understanding that you got. And when I say understanding, I'm not referring only to some theoretical knowledge. Because this is one of the challenges we've had historically. We thought if we had some people that um, came to an evangelism series or even one night and they heard the truth about the Sabbath, they got it. Hey, now they know. Well, knowledge and understanding does not work like that. Sometimes somebody needs to hear it seven different times, seven different ways to stick, to really get to the deeper level of understanding. When somebody is at that level of understanding, it's hard to say. It's not our responsibility to decide, okay, I'm not going to waste my time on this person here because this person already knows. What do you know about what they know? So the, the learning process is taken in account. And we can see that in the New Testament as well. In the same discourse the Apostle Paul gives in Athens, he says that God winks at the time of ignorance, but now, he says, he asks everybody to repent. So yeah, God winks, but at the same time, God has the expectation of turning the attitude, changing the attitude toward Him. Yes, I think I, I get what you're asking. Let me say it back so you can confirm if that's what uh, you're asking or not. So the question would be this. The narrative of uh, this section, and practically we could say that most of the Bible is written in a patriarchal frame of mind. When I say patriarchal, I'm not saying it in a negative or pejorative way necessarily. I'm saying that a writing that appears in a certain century no matter if you put that century 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago or 50 years ago, a writing will tend to reflect some features of that society. So if you are in a patriarchal society, you would expect that writing to somehow reflect something of that patriarchal society. But then... If it's written in a patriarchal uh, mindset, you can also notice that from time to time, the woman element is emphasized. But it's like a, a hidden corner that you can easily slip over and uh, you didn't even notice what happened. So why that? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, well, I believe, although there are few very striking elements where women play the main roles, 
There are, however, moments like that. We still have pretty strong pointers. One of the pointer, for instance, in Rachel's case, is this expression we've seen before, God, what is the expression? God remembered. remembered. God remembered. Is this God remembered known by this time, by the time we get to the story of uh, Rachel giving birth? It's known. From where? Where did we find this for the first time? In Sarah's story, yes, we have that element too. But the first time is not Sarah, but Noah. Correct. Noah. That's the first time we have the expression God remembered. So, for somebody that studies the text with a very... Uh, focused attitude, this God remembered will immediately jump out and will tell you there's something important happening there in the life of that woman. We started this last week and I would like to refer back to it. There was a question regarding the role of women the question came from Dina, or some say Dina, but really the Hebrew way of saying it is Dina. Dina, the daughter of uh, Jacob and Leah. They had one daughter, so Jacob had how many sons? Twelve, and they had one daughter, so total of 13 children. So the question was in that context, why was Dina not mentioned at the moment when uh, finally Jacob and his wives decide to go back to Canaan. Because the story says he took his sons and his wives, placed them on camels, and left. Where's Dinah? Ever since, I, uh, I processed a little more, and I realized that Dinah seems to be the youngest, if you don't count Joseph. Joseph is the youngest at that time, because Rachel finally gave birth. Maybe so young that he still depends on his mom. We don't know exactly. Or maybe there is a way to calculate. I didn't look into that. But Dina seems to be just before Joseph. So she is a young girl. Maybe she was not put on a camel. Maybe there was another way of taking Dina with them. And uh, we know from the story that Dina was with them later on. Another possibility would be that Dina was left with family, and then later somebody came and caught up with them and uh, delivered Dina to them. We don't have anything in the story to say that. But what I'm getting to is it was suggested that maybe this is because women were not that important. There is a misconception about patriarchal society. And the misconception is that in a patriarchal society, every man is an abuser, and every woman is abused, and every man is important, and every woman is unimportant. And that is not true. Let me just give you a few pointers. Tell me in the story of Abraham, and the story of Abraham is written in the same patriarchal mindset. If you just look from the outside, knowing the whole story, who was the decision maker in uh, Abraham's story? Abraham or Sarah? Well, Abraham had his uh, role for sure. But you clearly see moments when uh, you have the impression Abraham has to sit down because somebody else is speaking. Is that true? Okay, take it one step further. In the story of uh, Isaac and Rebekah, 
Who's the decision maker in that family? Well, it's Isaac. Of course, he's the man. Uh, hard to say that Isaac is the strong guy and Rebecca has no say. No. You have critical moments when Rebecca just plays with Isaac like that. Move one step further, Jacob. In Jacob's situation, who made the decisions? Jacob, of course. Why did he call his wives to the field to have a conversation with them? And then how come Rachel and Leah did trading among themselves to know in whose tent Jacob was going to sleep that night. So what I'm trying to emphasize is let's move away from that mentality in which we think that uh, in patriarchal society it was the man and the man. Yeah, you, you can see abuse in that society, of course. You can see abuser and abused. But you cannot say that was a rule in the life of God's people. Because for good or bad, you see strong decisions that were made by women in those stories, and the men just ran with them. So when Abraham got Hagar pregnant, Sarah decided that when Jacob got Bilha, Rachel gave her to him. Same is true for Zilpa. So, yeah, those are some decisions made by women. I'm not debating whether it was a good decision or bad decision here. Interesting question. So, we have these women Three women, we have Leah, Bilha, and Zilpa, all giving birth to different kids. And there are all kind of beautiful names given to them, right? And uh, then, finally, Rachel gives birth to Joseph. And Joseph is the chosen not all these other kids. Joseph is the chosen for what? Because Joseph is not the one that carries on the genealogy. The one that carries on the genealogy toward Jesus is who? Benjamin. Not Benjamin. Mm -mm. Judah, correct. Judah. And Judah is not the firstborn, which you would expect to be the case. It was the what? The fourth. The fourth. Because you have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and then Judah. So, yeah, God is pretty uh, tricky in his ways of choosing who will continue the genealogy toward Jesus. Now, Joseph is the chosen in a certain sense. In what sense? In the sense that God foreknew some things that were going to happen. God knew there was going to be a famine in the land of Canaan. God knew that whole area was going to be in danger, not only Canaan, but also Egypt, because the famine was going to be huge. And God provided in advance, so that is a sort of providential guy. So Joseph is the providential guy that God uses for a certain context to solve a certain problem in a certain time. And yes, in that sense, he is chosen. But is he chosen in a sense that uh, 
God could not have used somebody else in that role? Not necessarily. If it was not Joseph, God could have prepared and uh, used somebody else. But this is totally up to God, whom he will use in what role, in what context, for what purpose. So this is his decision. Joseph is a prefiguration of Jesus Christ, and that's exactly the story we are going to present today in the VBS class. Okay? Thank you so much. Let's thank the Lord for his guidance. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray that you will uh, take the process further and you will continue to teach us in Jesus' name through the Holy Spirit. Amen.